Joe scrapes his knee, falling off his bike. Mild pain, he carries on, pain goes away. A year later, Joe experiences severe stabbing pain in his back while helping a friend move. He takes Tylenol uh, extra strength, rests. Ten weeks go by, pain has not gone away. Joe's sleep is interrupted, and his anxiety is at an all-time high. He goes to see his doctor, who prescribes a few days of oxycodone to take the edge off. The medication helps him get out of bed, but now Joe is worried about the severe pain returning once the oxycodone runs out. And this cycle of pain and worry doesn't end, because now Joe's convinced that oxycodone is the only thing that helps, and he would not be alone in thinking this way. The U.S. is 4% of the world's population, but consumes 80% of the world's opioids. Yet, we continue to complain of the highest burden of pain in the world. One in five people, whether adult or child, has chronic pain. Pain is a public health crisis in the United States. I think it's safe to say that the pills alone are not working. Too many people, medical professionals included, think that pain is something that lives in the body and treat it as such with pills. But this is a failure because pain medications like oxycodone will make you more sensitive to pain over time. And pills only engage a small part of how we experience pain. There is a better way to treat pain that just doesn't get talked about enough, and it involves more than just pills. As a pediatric pain physician, I have seen worried, scared kids in wheelchairs flourish into empowered, restored kids standing on their own two feet using the biopsychosocial model of treatment. And to help you understand it, a question for you. How many of you have been in love before? I'm talking the butterflies in the stomach, heart racing, mind goes blank when the person comes around. Now, when you share with friends your experience, does any of them ever ask you, hmm, are you feeling all of that in your head or in your body? It's like, uh... Both? <laughs> Duh. And you would be really confused by that question. Yet, people with chronic pain are constantly asked to put their experience in one of these two boxes. Pain, like falling in love, involves the mind and body, and it colors every aspect of life. I know this intimately, as I grew up with pain. During those tender preteen years where kids are going off to softball practice, vicious arguments between my parents served as the backdrop music to my life. The emotional baggage I carried created isolation and loneliness. I mean, after all, I couldn't go up to my friends and say, hey, I live in daily fear that my parents are going to get separated. I mean, it's not the most popular conversation topic for an 11-year-old. And so no, my arm wasn't in a cast, my pain was invisible, and in some ways, isn't that worse? I mean, when people see a cast, they know to approach you tenderly, offer support, but if your pain's invisible, where's your support? Or even worse, you could be accused of faking. The isolation, loneliness, the invisible pain I felt drove me to support those with whom I have the same kinship, people in chronic pain. Chronic pain is when those signals that are supposed to protect us by alerting us to bodily damage become crosswired, and the signaling itself is the problem. So imagine burning, stabbing, 
aching sensations on repeat. I mean, this cross-wiring can be crippling, but thankfully, it's reversible with the right treatment. I want you to learn of a model of treatment that has helped millions in chronic pain learn to love their life again. And even if you don't have chronic pain, maybe it's social anxiety, financial insecurity, problems at home. By using this model to fortify your mind and body, it puts you back in the driver's seat of your life again. The biopsychosocial model of treatment. Biopsychosocial was a term coined by Dr. George Engel in 1977. A psychiatrist who believed that in order for a clinician to adequately treat patients, we must tend not only to the biological aspects of illness, but the psychological and social dimensions as well. Dr. John Bonica, a pain physician with chronic pain himself, employed this model in his clinic. So when patients came in, they saw a variety of different physicians, psychologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and they received individualized, active treatment plans that engaged their mind and body. The result? Significant improvement in their quality of life. So, for those of you who have fallen in love before, how many of you were checked out of the experience? Like, meh, I could take it or leave it, half in, half out, it's whatever. No, right? When you fall in love, you are fully immersed, mind and body. You believe you can be anything, do anything. If there was something that your love wanted, you did it, even though you didn't feel like it, out of love for them. In order for this model to work, we have to carry that same mindset of optimism, of open-mindedness, of showing up even if we don't feel like it. We have to apply that same mindset to ourselves in order for this model to work. So now that we discussed the mindset, let's break down biopsychosocial model. The first part, the bio. Daily movement is key. Literature recommends 30 minutes of heart pumping activity a day to reverse that cross wiring we talked about earlier. I extend this recommendation to patients all the time. And one day in 2017, my Teenage patient asked me, Dr. Peterson, is this something that you do? And I had to be honest. I mean, I certainly understood the merits of exercise, but doing it was another story altogether. So, after my patient called me out, I began my journey of daily exercise. And it started with just 10 minutes of running. That's all I could do at the time. And I eventually worked up to 30 and tried a bunch of different exercises in between. And the one thing I realized with daily exercise is that we all acknowledge that we have to wash our bodies regularly and feed our bodies regularly, but we're also obliged to move our bodies regularly too. So I would encourage you, instead of asking, should I exercise today? Reframe, how am I going to exercise today? Whether it's yoga or Tai Chi or something more high intensity, like cycling, swimming, boxing, or all of the above. Try out different movements. Find out what excites you and makes your heart race. Consistency is key. If all you can do right now is five to 10 minutes a day, start there and work your way up to 30. The worst thing you can do is take a bunch of days off and then try to cram it all in in one hour session. That's a setup for injury. And you don't have to go at this alone. 
There's group classes, personal training, but the key is finding a way to employ this 30 minutes of heart pumping activity. It'll improve your mood and sleep, which will fortify you from stress. Now, into the psycho part of the biopsychosocial model. Exercise serves as a twofer. It works the body and mind. So you might think you have the healthiest self-esteem, and then you start moving. For me, the first mile was the worst, because here comes the negative self-talk. What are you doing in the dark running? Aren't your hands getting cold? You know, there's no shame in turning around now. You're not that far from the house. But the more I saw what I was capable of doing, the more I learned to ignore this negative self-talk. And we know this doesn't happen just with exercise. You see it in other parts of life, too. How often have you had the thought to go up for a promotion, a position, or an audition, and the voice comes? Who are you? to be applying for that, they will laugh you out of the room. And that stops you from taking action. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a modality we use to address this negative self-talk head on, to remove the obstacles we put in our own way that interfere with our ability to progress. What negative thoughts are holding you back? Meditation and prayer are other cognitive strategies that we look at to decrease our emotional reactivity to life's events, meaning that we're actually taking time to process what is happening without emotionally responding first. We all have met emotionally reactive people. I mean, have you ever accidentally stepped on someone's shoe in the street and almost got cussed out? By using these cognitive strategies, we're able to take the time to decide how we want to respond. We then make better decisions, which overall, with making better decisions, we're able to remain calm during the entire process. And then finally, the social part of the bio psychosocial model. When's the last time you did something just for you, something you truly enjoy, whether that's picking up a paintbrush or musical instrument or just being around the people that you love? Far too often, we dismiss our own joys and hobbies as something we'll get to later. But one of the first things we teach in chronic pain is to get back to the things you love right now, even if it's just a small, modified version of it. How can you incorporate the things you love on a regular basis? Now, as for Joe, he partnered with the pain clinic and found that his pain decreased with movement, weightlifting, meditation, Daily time in nature served as stepping stones to his recovery. If you have chronic pain, this model was made with you in mind. Even if you don't have chronic pain, still do this. It is found to improve quality of life and is protective from developing chronic pain. So what exercises will you try? What approaches will you use to overcome negative self-talk? What long abandoned hobby will you pick up again? Fall in love with yourself, mind and body. You are worth the investment in discovering how the biopsychosocial model looks on you. <laughs>